Today we have the pleasure of welcoming our first speaker, Karen Rollins. She will speak on identification and management of invasive plant species. Karen is with the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia in Tifton. Karen is the Invasive Species Coordinator at the Bugwood Images and, in, and the Bugwood Images Coordinator at the Center for Invasive Species in Ecosystem Health Service at the University of Georgia. She has her Master's of Science from University of Texas in Arlington. Previously, Rollins worked at the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge as a naturalist developing many programs, including invasive species awareness. Karen also worked with the Texas Invaders Program as regional coordinator, collecting data, training volunteers, and validating data submitted by volunteers. Her duties at University of Georgia include development and delivery of outreach materials and presentations, expanding the development and operation of the Georgia Invasive Task Force, developing cooperative invasive species management areas in Georgia, classifications of images and information into the Bugwood Image Database System, development and training associated with the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, and field work including installation and management of research plot and collection of field survey data. Her goal is to keep, preserve, and restore our native habitats and landscapes by working in the field of invasive species. Welcome, Karen. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bodhi. Um, okay. Can you see my invasive species screen? Just one to... second, Karen. Oh, okay. I'm taking this over to you. Okay. And what I want it to do is show this one. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for attending the webinar today. And I'm going to be speaking about invasive species in Georgia, but this does apply across the Southeast. At uh, the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, it's a matter of teamwork. And we have professors uh, entomology, forestry, um, arborists, biologists, and um, technologists. And we have uh, folks devoted, well, one te technical person's devoted completely to iPhone apps and another one's devoted completely to Android apps. So we do a lot of combining biology and technology here. And again, it's a matter of teamwork when we're looking at the larger community. Um, forestry, agriculture, um, we, they both use information technology to help tackle the issues of invasive species. The information that it goes into EDMAPS, which is the database which holds information on invasive species, can give important information to researchers, land managers, and the grain industry, as well as homeowners. We know that chemical pollution is bad, but we kind of got lucky with that one. Um, chemical, we found out that the chemicals would break down over time so that their effects were not as bad and we were able to bring back some of the species we were afraid we were gonna lose, such as the bald eagle. Unfortunately, while chemicals degrade over time, invasive species do not do that. They're living organisms, so their priority is to continue living and to reproduce or and to grow. <clears throat> and so that makes uh, this a biological problem different than the chemical problem. And it's also very complicated. It's not just one thing. So in the original image, you recognized kudzu, I'm sure, the poster child of invasive species. And um, just within the last few years, an accidental introduction of an insect, they're calling the kudzu bug, um, has had a negative effect on the growth of kudzu, which is a good thing. That helps farmers and foresters and, and other people trying to control kudzu. Unfortunately, when it hits an area where there's soybean and no kudzu, then the soybean um, 
farmers will be taking a big hit. So it's a very complicated problem. There's all types of invasive species. There's aquatic and terrestrial. One of the aquatic species, um, actually there's a couple of different uh, species of these Asian carp. And as you can see in the picture, top picture center here, them jumping. In this bottom picture, you can see these nets the researchers have, and they're researching these carp. Look how, how high they're jumping over these boats. The nets are there to protect the researchers. People have actually been hospitalized after being hit by these um, fish jumping over the boats. And then we have nice little um, animals like this to contend with in part of the Southeast here, Florida. And this is a problem that is moving north. Again, the EDMAPS uh, invasive species database is showing us from reports people are making in Florida that these species are moving north. And it's been shown that they can definitely live as far north as South Georgia. We're not sure exactly yet just how far north they can go. Another species that's causing problems across the United States, anywhere that there's enough water and that it doesn't get too cold or freezing in the wintertime, you will find feral hogs causing issues. And they cause issues for everyone from homeowners to uh, farmers to foresters. Everyone has to deal with these. People hunting, um, out hiking, can come across these animals and they're very dangerous in the wild. You can see in this yard, the top left-hand picture, that looks like it's been plowed and that is the kind of damage that a hog does. And unfortunately, they, their favorite type of area to plow up like that are wetlands where a lot of our um, most delicate ecosystems and several endangered species are. Another issue that we've been looking at recently across the Southeast and um, <clears throat> has most recently become an issue in Georgia are various insects. For example, emerald ash borer has been making its way south over the last several years. And we now have, um, we, and I've just heard yesterday now the entire state of Georgia is quarantined, not just the northern part of Georgia for emerald ash borer. And these insects do move on their own, but generally on their own, they move very slowly. And so when, while they're moving slowly, it gives researchers time to find ways to combat them and, and try to rescue our ash trees. Unfortunately, things like the firewood can move them very quickly over many miles. Um, we're nice folks, you know, if we go camping, we'll throw some firewood over in the back of the truck. You know, we had a tree that died and you don't want to let it go to waste, so you cut it up for firewood. And when you're done camping, you've got a few pieces left. And so we offer the camper next to us, ask if they'd like to have that wood, and of course they would. So they have a piece left over maybe and take that home with them. And, you know, in the matter of a couple of days, it could travel, you know, 500 to 1,000 miles. And that's how these species have spread so quickly over such a long distance. So it's something very simple. And I know that Georgia State Parks now require you to use local firewood. And most of them, if I believe all of them do now, provide firewood on the property. Just to be clear, um, not all exotics are invasive. Most of our food, 98% of our food is from introduced species. And they're also used for things like landscape restoration, biological pest control, hunting and fishing. That's how the hogs were brought in and deliberately released many times um, for hunting. And they're brought in as pets. Um, the 
Hell's Cat was not originally native to this continent and it has been brought in and is devastating to songbirds and other animals um, when cats are allowed to run free out there. They're actually, cats are actually considered one of the top 10 worst invasive species in the world. So one of the things we look at is trying to predict which plants will become invasive. We're still bringing new things in. And so as we bring these new um, plants and other organisms in, we want to try to weed out those that can become an invasive pest. Unfortunately, the same things that cause them to be invasive also tend to be good qualities in an ornamental plant. If it's hardy and easy to grow, that means it's a habitat generalist. If it doesn't re require a lot of care, it's carefree. That means it usually grows really well, tends to outcompete other plants. It's easy to propagate, has abundant flowers. That, of course, means there's a lot of seed available uh, to grow new plants from. If it attracts birds, birds eat that fruit and spread that seed um, sometimes many, many miles away. But quite often it's in a nearby um, spot, a minimally managed habitat, uh, an undeveloped corner lot or something, and they'll sit there and, and those corner lots tend to be covered with invasive species from uh, birds depositing the seed. And disease and pest resistant. And because they're disease and pest resistant, those diseases and pests were left back in their home countries, then um, they're not affected by those things and it gives them an advantage when they do escape into the wild. So why haven't we figured this out before? Why has it taken us so long? The problem has been that there's a time when there's an introduction, when we first start planting this in our landscapes. Um, it takes several years usually for them to escape and naturalize. That's not always the case though. Sometimes this happens very quickly. And, but at some point in time, whether it's over a hundred years or 20 years, there begins this almost straight up growth rate, an exponential growth rate. And once it gets started on this exponential growth rate, it's probably too late to ever eradicate the um, species at that time. And the best we can do at that point is management. This is the actual lag phase for Chinese privet in the south. And you can see it was introduced around 1880, the late 1870s. And it was right around 1960 when it started hitting that exponential growth rate. And now it's one of the top invaders across the southeast. And and in other areas, the northeastern United States, the west coast of the United States, many areas, uh, privet is a huge problem. So why does this happen? We talked about this a little bit um, earlier, lack of natural predators and pests and diseases, those things that didn't come with them um, when they were brought into the country. And so they don't have those things that the plants that evolved here have to deal with. So it gives them an advantage there. And habitat changes, our own management practices and land use changes can help to um, favor these invasive species infestations. Different types of habitat disturbance um, along roadsides and this seeds and other uh, propagule materials can be deposited along roadsides from all different types of transportation. Uh, tie, it can be on tires or in the load itself being moved. There was a situation where um, a semi-truck load of eggs was turned back at the Mexican border and Mexico would not allow them in because when they inspected it, they found kudzu bugs in the, in the containers. So that was sent back so that you can see what a huge loss that was for um, for the people trying to sell those eggs because at that point in time um, it would have been difficult to get them to a market before they were no longer usable. 
um, cut over forests, ag fields, uh, streamside management zones, construction sites. Construction sites are really bad. They open up the land, so any seed coming in is, uh, has had all the other vegetation removed. Pastures, old fields, things that are left, um, you often see in fence rows, uh, and I know in this area, chinaberry tree seems like line, it lines every single fence row in South Georgia. Ditches and road maintenance. We went to check um, the report of Kogon grass, which is one of the top 10 worst uh, invasive species in the world, invasive plants, and went down to check it in a county in South Georgia, and it was Kogon grass where we found it. And you could see where it had been moved all the way down the, the dirt road. As they graded that road, there was all along the edge, there was Kogon grass growing where it had been moved just through regular maintenance. So these are um, the newest numbers we have right now. Uh, occupation in Georgia forests. And I can tell you that these numbers are echoed in the other southeastern states as well. Worse in some areas, I mean, you know, they're, sometimes they're a little bit different, but um, they're, they're pretty close to these percentages. And look at kudzu, the poster child of invasive species. It's not even close to being number one. So number five on the list. Um, and uh, Japanese stilt grass is another name for this Nepalese brown top. Microstigium is the genus name. And on the privets, Chinese privet, Ligustrum sinense, and glossy privet, Ligustrum lucidum, are the two worst in Georgia. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, Japanese climbing fern is covering up large areas, causing problems in uh, pine plantations. It is a true fern, so it spreads by spores. So you can imagine um, how quickly that spreads. Non-native wisterias, and we have them listed that way because there are there is a native wisteria. So 24.8 million acres occupied for in forested acres in the south. So this is across the southeast. This is Japanese climbing fern. And if you look at um, this picture, you can see this is the sterile fern, the sterile frond. And this is what happens when you see this, you know that it's fertile. But when you see Japanese climbing fern, that's the time to remove it. The second you see it is the time to, to treat it or get it out of there. Um, once it starts reproducing, those spores blow in the wind. And we've seen people do prescribed burns and come back and have 10 acres covered with Japanese climbing fern seedlings. And Japanese climbing fern will burn green. So it acts as a fire ladder up into the crown of the tree. And you know what happens to the tree if, it, if the crown burns. I mean, this is a fire evolved ecosystem. So those trees are evolved to have fire go through them, um, but they're not evolved to have their crowns burned. Kogon grass, which we mentioned before, is an extreme fire hazard. It produces a lot of smoke. It burns really hot and really fast. That makes it very dangerous fire to fight. Again, on the Japanese climbing fern, we won't mention which box store this was found in, but you need to keep your eyes open out there. And pine straw, too, they do inspect for this going through. So if you're managing a pine plantation, you want to be sure and um, treat for Japanese climbing fern if you see it and keep that out of the stand. Kogon grass, this is it in bloom. It is blooming this time of year. We do have native species which are similar to this, but they are blooming in the fall. So this is the only one you'll see blooming this time of year that looks like this. They have these rhizomes, and this will be so thick with rhizomes in there that it's almost impossible to dig it up. But if you find on the edge where you can dig one up, those are sharp enough to draw blood. 
These are some of the ways that, that cogung grass can spread on roadways and waterways. Again, best management practices. You always want to work in an uninfested area first, and it doesn't matter whether it's cocon grass or what invasive species you're working with. You want to work in an uninfested area first, work in the infested area last, and be sure to clean your um, equipment. This is cocon grass. It can grow 10 feet tall, and because it blooms earlier in the year, it also senesces earlier in the year. So during the time people are coming through and doing prescribed burns, um, you've got all of this material that's ready to burn. So you have a lot of tree kills in a stand like that. In 2006, this was what we first saw with cocon grass in 10 counties. This was when it was first coming to our attention. And this is the most recent report um, from the Georgia Forestry Commission, and they have been treating it over this entire time since 2006. Every single spot that's been reported, they have treated. And as you can see, um, they've treated a, a total of 1,065 spots, and of those, 723 have been eradicated. Only 183 are still active. Year one and year two, they continue to go back and, and check those spots until they've been um, negative for at least three years. So a, hundred, a total of almost 300 acres treated. This is what it looks like across the southeast. It came in and shipping originally, they believe, into this area, into the port. In Florida, it was actually brought in and tested as a, for pasture for forage material, um, for, as a forage grass, and very unsuccessfully. It has such a high silicate content that even goats won't eat it. So it's not good, good to feed anything. The Georgia Forestry Commission has a program that is still uh, funded as of this point, and they will treat cogon grass at no charge to the landowner. So if this is ever found, it needs to be reported immediately, either to the Forest Service, to your local forester. You can also report it to EDMAPS. If you report it in EDMAPS, the Georgia Forestry Commission immediately gets an email. So they are notified immediately if, if a report of this is made. They will go out immediately and check it. I mean, I, and I'm talking definitely no longer than 48 hours. Usually it's within 24 hours. They're out checking the spot. They, if it is positive, it is cogon grass. They talk with the landowners and work up an agreement with the landowners and Georgia Forestry Commission treats it for free and goes back and checks it and continues to treat it until it's eradicated. You don't hear for free very often anymore. And so this is what I just mentioned here is the forest health program for the state of Georgia um, and other states do have programs on cogon grass. So for your different areas, you would contact uh, Lynn Womack here or Chris Barnes for the blue areas and the yellow counties, Mark McClure would be the person you report to. But you can, as I said, you can also report to your local forester um, or you can report it online to edmaps.org or through the CEDEN smartphone app. So when we're talking about an invasive species, this time while it's being introduced and it's establishing itself, this is the time that it needs to be located in a, and the time that we have a chance of eradicating it. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we've got people out there on the ground reporting what they're finding. That's one of the most important reasons for EDMAPS is the early detection and rapid response, the possibility of being able to do that. Some of the species that we've been talking about, this is this particular ligustrum is Chinese privet. 
and you can see i mean this is covered with flowers here so that's going to be covered with fruit i mean one shrub can produce an, enough fruit to populate a forest <clears throat> tallow tree is another invasive species that um, you can find in many areas in georgia it likes um, riparian areas especially and the wax covered seeds that's why they look like popcorn is because of the heavy wax coating allows them to float on water so they can travel quite a ways and establish them in another area and they actually alter the soil um, content or the components in the soil because they have such a high tanning content. So when you remove the tallow tree and go back to try to plant native species back in there, it can be difficult to get those to establish and grow again because of the changes in the soil. Non-native rose species, multiflora rose is one um, that I have seen most often across the state. Um, Cherokee rose is our state flower that is a non-native plant and is considered invasive. I don't actually see it very often in the habitats in Georgia. Uh, multiflora rose is what I see most often. But there's uh, about three species that we generally see. McCartney rose is another one. And we do have native species of roses too. So. You do want to know what you're looking at before you start um, eradicating it. The non-native wisterias, um, I mentioned that we do have a native wisteria. It blooms at a different time. The flower looks very similar, but it's smaller. And the leaf overall is smaller. This is one entire leaf. And on the native species, it's smaller. You also will never see a native wisteria growing like this, taking over a whole area and, and covering trees. And this non-native wisteria can actually kill trees. You can see how it's wrapped around this pine tree, how the pine tree is actually growing up around that. So that will um, girdle the tree and kill it in time. This is chinaberry tree. <coughs> this is found also in many areas in Georgia. The berries are actually toxic. Some people react to this um, the same as you do to poison ivy or poison oak. And um, it also likes riparian areas, but it will grow in drier areas. As I said, uh, many, many fence rows. This is in a fence actually here. Tree of Heaven, this is an extremely tough tree. It will grow in very harsh conditions. I've heard it reported growing in New York City out of the sidewalk. You don't get much tougher than that. Um, I personally have seen it growing out of the top of a sign hanging in the air. So whatever little bit of dirt and dust could blow into that top of that sign was enough for this tree to get started and grow. giant reed. Um, this one is especially bad if it's growing in riparian areas because it uses such a huge amount of water. Out west where the rivers are um, smaller than the rivers here, it actually dries up rivers. And so in the west it causes even more problems because of that. But as time goes on and the um, our climate seems to be drier now. We're not getting as much rain as we have in the past. This will become a bigger and bigger issue. So invasive species have negative effects on natural areas and wildlife. So, you know, you realize if there's an invasive plant growing there, for example, then you can't have the native plant that should be growing there. And the food that that native plant produces for the native wildlife is not there. 
Um, it alters not just, um, you know, taking that spot, but it alters the structure of native plant communities and reduces habitat fitness for the wildlife. So if you have an area where privet has come in and taken over, then um, there's nothing else in there to eat. I mean, the only thing that'll grow in there is privet. It shades the soil so completely. Even if there's a tree that's growing there, which is often what happens, is the birds will sit in the tree after eating uh, privet fruit. So you wind up with a ring of privet around that tree. And when that tree dies, there is no new tree growing because the seeds the tree dropped on the ground have do not have enough water or sunlight to get started. So there's no new tree recruitment around um, privet areas. And some of them actually alter the soil chemistry as we talked about and the natural hydrology as we talked just talked about with um, the um, giant cane and the Arundo Donax and also the historical fire regime. And there's several of them that have a negative effect on that. There's other things um, as well. There was a study done by University of Georgia recently, and it was two native wildlife species, native wolf spider, and one of our small native amphibians, a narrow, narrow mouth toad. And they, the spiders normally kind of keep, keep each other in check because the big spiders eat the little spiders, so there's not as many to grow up. But the um, Japanese stilt grass or microstigium that's growing in many areas um, around Atlanta, well, I think it's even as far south as Macon, it's been found now and, and on north in Georgia, has, is providing so much cover for the spiders that more of the baby spiders are able to grow up. So they're having to find another food source and what they're eating are these small amphibians. So their numbers are plummeting. And so those are two native species that are affected by this non-native plant. It just gets, once you start looking at the issues, it's just layer upon layer. So this is the Japan, uh, Chinese privet here. You can see how many fruits are on there. And there's uh, my little cardinal friends saying you shouldn't eat that. It'll spread everywhere. Maybe, but I'm hungry and all the good stuff is gone. And there's been some studies, um, different results with different studies. Some of the studies in, seem to indicate that when the birds are eating the native um, the fruit from the native plants that should be there, that they're healthier, where when they're dining on nothing but a diet of privet, and sometimes that may be all that's available to them or all that's easily available to them, um, that they're not as healthy, and that makes them prey to um, diseases and other things, other stressors that they encounter. So straight from our backyard to theirs, this is in the Oki Finoki. And so places are pristine natural areas that are so beautiful and so special. The things we have here in Georgia, we have some habitats found nowhere else in the world, plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. And those things are being endangered by invasive species plants and animals. Now these animals are native, but these species I've got here, Nandina, uh, exotic bush honeysuckle, and Chinese privet are causing issues across the state of Georgia. Had somebody ask one time how we could get the birds to stop doing that and popped into my mind was little birdie diapers, but you know, can't figure out how to get them to wear those. So. has negative effects on recreation. When you've got a stand of um, privet or a big stand of kudzu or honeysuckle, um, any of those that come in and just completely take over, um, there's 
okay, sorry, I just went um, went blank, but there's there's many of them. Bradford pear can cause impenetrable thickets. Um, Celastrus obicular. Okay, sorry, I can remember the scientific name and can't remember the common name. Um, but it causes impenetrable thickets and they, some of those have really fierce thorns on them that you don't want to get close to. And when you're dealing with something like that, you can't go hiking through that. You can't go camp, you can't camp there. You can't hunt through that. Um, which you probably wouldn't be because the animals aren't going to be there anyway. It reduces the diversity and beauty of the of the native plant communities. And if it's doing that, then you know it's uh, reducing the diversity of native wildlife as well. And again, the fire hazard erosion. Kudzu, for example, was brought in. One of the reasons it was brought in was to control erosion. It actually increases erosion. It has a long tuberous root and you need lots of um, horizontal fibrous roots to help erosion, to help stop erosion. But the long tuberous root and the stem that grows up and then the vine grows up over the top of other plants. So it actually forms kind of an umbrella that allows the rain or the water to come down the hills underneath on the bare soil and washes that soil away. So actually increases erosion instead of decreasing it. And this is a universal problem. This is not just a Georgia problem, not just a Southeastern problem. It is um, Western Hemisphere, the Old World, everywhere. The only place that there might not be a problem with invasive species um, would be maybe Antarctica, where nothing grows. It would be about the only spot. So it has negative effects on agriculture and forestry. Of course, reducing crop yields. Um, again, the kudzu bug coming in, one of the reasons they didn't have biocontrol for kudzu is because it's in the bean family and we have things like soybean, a really important crop that's also in the bean family. So they had to be extremely careful bringing anything in. Well, kudzu bug was introduced accidentally and it does love kudzu, it loves kudzu the best, but it also really likes soybean. As I mentioned earlier, areas where there's no kudzu, the soybean crops will really be um, affected negatively. In Georgia, we kind of even out because the kudzu itself is something the farmers have to keep off their crops. They have to manage that to, to keep it from overgrowing their crops. So the whatever bean crops the kudzu bugs eat, it makes up for in the kudzu it eats. So we got lucky here in Georgia and it's kind of um, kind of evens out there, but that's not the case with everything. Um, it's unplatable or even toxic to livestock. Um, some of the things in the nightshade family that are non-native and are causing big problems across the state are eaten by livestock and, um, and are toxic. The, again, the natural vegetation that should be there. And if we're talking about agriculture, of course, that's the crops that have been planted. If it's talking about forestry, then if it's growing, if you've got chinaberry trees or trees of heaven or anything like that, that's coming up in a pine plantation, a new pan plantation just planted, then that kind of competition slows down the rate of growth in the trees. And so there's, all different levels that they have to fight. And then there's the insects, the non-native insects as well that come in and attack um, many of the plants that we're trying to, trying to grow as crops in one way or another. And it increases management costs. I talked to someone who worked for Georgia Power a few years back. And at that point in time, she was telling me how many in the million of dollars um, it cost them to tackle invasive species, to keep them out of right of ways and off of um, power poles and the wires and so on. And you know that cost is passed on to us, the consumer. And the same thing would be for crops and forestry products, any of that, 
those, the more it costs them to grow those things, the more it costs us to buy them. Increasing fire risks, well, that is a danger to agriculture and forestry, and it's also a danger to, to anyone living nearby. This is a field of pogon grass um, in Florida that is six feet tall, at least, and this is right next to a subdivision there. And in the subdivision, it was a nice new little subdivision and every house had a big wooden fence all the way around the backyard. And they had this nice cocon grass growing right up to that fence. I only saw one person in one house there who had mowed outside that wooden fence to um, provide a little fire break. And it was a really windy day and I was just horrified thinking how dangerous that was. Somebody driving by could just throw a cigarette out and that neighborhood would go up in flames. You can see it here in a pine plant in a stand of pines. And again, this is going to reduce the productivity, the growth rate of those pines. The longer it takes for them to get the growth and be um, harvested, you know, the, the worse that is for the um, producer. So there's a lot of things that, um, that people can do to help out there. There's a lot of information out there available. Here at uh, the Center for Invasive Species, we run about 50 websites. One of those is invasive.org and invasiveplantatlas.org. And both of those are places you can go and get information on invasive species, including management. Um, Jim Miller uh, provided information in um, a booklet that the Forest Service produced and that booklet is online on Bugwood Wiki and it's available right from the home page on invasive.org. Um, you can report invasive species through EdMaps. Um, we've got smartphone apps available for that and there's also smartphone apps available for other things. If you go to the EdMaps home page you can find um, where you can click on our apps so you can see all the apps. Um, Squill on pigs is an example. Um, also the uh, brown marmorated stink bugs, uh, um, cotton advisor. So there's things for ag as, and for forestry as well as invasive species. So there's, and all of those smartphone apps and websites and all of the information therein are free to use. University of Georgia is a land grant university, so all of that information is free to use for, for your own use or for educational purposes. And it's, and it's available upon request for commercial use as well. Um, creating CISMAS, which is Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area for your region. We do have um, a couple of CISMAS in Georgia the largest one is over on the coast. It's the first and second coastal, um, second tier counties, coastal counties of Georgia. Sorry, I think I could say that better. First and second tier coastal counties in Georgia have formed a CISMA and they work together to tackle the problems of invasive species along the coastline. Um, Georgia EPSI is the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council and um, we have regular meetings, annual meetings where you can get um, credits and learn some management techniques and things and get your continuing education credits as well. And you get to hear from people across the state. Plant Wisely, the Garden Smart Plant Wise is a, a national project and it's just things like have a care if you share. So if you're sharing a plant, be sure it is a non-invasive or a native plant. Never, ever, ever share invasive plants. Other things you can do, educate. Educate yourself, of course, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your representatives. In EdMaps, you can go um, to the Tools and Training um, tab on the EdMaps homepage and find the um, your congressional district, the list of invasive species that have been reported in your congressional district. 
So you um, can use that to help educate your representatives because quite often they simply don't know what the issues are or what the problems are. But you guys are out there on the ground. You know it, you see it. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir whenever I talk to a group like this because you guys are seeing the invasive species and the effects they're having out there. Um, there's When you're replacing an invasive species, think about replacing that with a native plant or at least be sure it's you're replacing it with a non-invasive plant if it's not native. Um, volunteer. There's a lot of different volunteer opportunities in, in the state of Georgia and I know there are in other states as well. This is what invasive.org, what the homepage looks like. Always remember to scroll down, you'll see new things. This is the book I was talking about with Jim Miller, a field guide for the identification of invasive plants in Southern forests. But this is also a management guide. So all of the most common, and I think there's about 50 species, the best management techniques are found right there. You click on that and it takes you to the list and you just click on the plant you're looking for um, that you want to find out how to manage and it will give you the best recommendations there. And Jim Miller worked for the USDA Forest Service for over 30 years and his research was an invasive plant so he was uh, top in his field for that. This is the home page for EdMaps. When uh, you create an account, it's free to do. And you will have, if you click on my Ed Maps, it takes you to your dashboard. I'm a biologist, but that's what our technology people have told me that's called your own personal page there. And um, that's where your most recent reports will be and so on. You can see some of the projects we've worked on here that we've got. So we've created smartphone apps for invasive species specifically for groups across the United States and four provinces of Canada. Here's that tools and training tab I was talking about to find um, the list of invasive species in your congressional district. This is the Seedin app. This is designed to be fast and easy to use. We also have um, a new app coming out and that is EdMaps Pro. The Seedin app, the two biggest differences between them is the Seedin app has a field guide in it. So it has pictures and a write up for each and each species that's in the app and there's about 300 in there. And so anytime you start adding images to an app, it gets really big. And so some people have had issues using it simply because the app is so big. With EdMaps Pro, you already know what these species look like out there. And so you don't really need the field guide part of it, but you can download exactly what you need from your dashboard on your My EdMaps tab. And you can download the species you need and the county maps that you need um, before you leave the office. And then you go out in the field and you've got just what you need in, in your app. And so what that does is speed things up a lot for you. And for um, pros, that's important. You want to be able to report that or collect that information and, and go on. You do not want to be standing around waiting, looking through, trying to find a certain species. You've got all the species you want right there on one screen. So it shortens the process a lot. There, we're doing uh, first detector workshops. These do have uh, credits um, in conjunction with them. And we've got one coming up in uh, June, in June on the coast. And we've got another one uh, coming up in um, North Georgia. And then there's going to be one in October in Athens at the State Botanical Garden. If you want information on where, when and where those will be held, more specific information, this is my email address and you're welcome to contact me and I'll send you more specific information. There's also Connect to Protect program. 
This is through the State Botanical Garden of Georgia that is part of the University of Georgia. And this is intended um, to bring pollinator conservation uh, more into public awareness. And so, for example, I've sponsored two schools um, near my, where my grandchildren go to school and I sponsored two schools to do this. So they have a garden, um, people at the State Botanic Garden advise them, help them plan the project, and they also send them plants. And along with that, they get a sign that talks about pollinator conservation and the importance of it and what they're doing. And there's several different projects like this ongoing across the Southeast. So to finish up here, I want to show you, this is Kogon grass. So six feet of this grass, as far as you can see, so thick you can hardly walk through it. And this is a natural, this is actually a natural longleaf pine community. And that is a beautiful way to spend a day through there, walking through there. Um, the native wildlife you see, the native plants you see, the diversity, it's, it's just gorgeous. We are, we're lucky where we live. This is a beautiful state. and has a lot to offer for anyone interested in nature. And this is what we wanna see. We wanna keep this out. And again, this is privet. And I tell people that this can cover large areas, but until you've seen it, you may not believe it. Um, there was a park I was working at. Um, we went to help the community in Fort Worth to rescue their park from privet. And there was the vast majority of this park was literally covered with privet. Um, one area they had kept mowed on a regular basis, the privet was growing about an inch and a half high. I mean, that privet had been growing an inch and a half high for many years and only because they kept it mowed had it not taken over as it had in the rest of the park. And that's just, I, I don't know whether it's more scary or more sad, but, <laughs> but it's not, definitely it is not good. This is a natural um, mixed hardwood community, the natural um, understory community that you would find there. And again, you know, the wildlife and the native um, flora that you're gonna see in there is beautiful. Again, a really nice way to spend the day. You can go hiking through there, camping, hunting, fishing in the lakes. There's invasive plants that literally cover the surface of lakes so that there's no shrimping if you're in Louisiana, there's no fishing if you're in Georgia, it covers the lake. And it can do that in like a week's time. It's incredible how fast some of those things can grow. So we conquer the bow weevil. We can conquer invasive species too, but it's a team effort. We'll take all of us. Let that one speak for itself. And this is an example of one of our native species. And it is found still, I think in a couple of places, they found it in the wild. Um, it's been preserved mostly though, because it's such a beautiful flower um, in the landscape trade. It's used quite extensively in the landscape trade. And that flower is about as, it's at least three inches across at least, yeah. And that's it for me. Thank you, Karen. Um, it was really informative. And uh, we have a question from the audience and uh, it was um, relating to the Kogon grass and uh, the, the question pertains to the eradication. Can you burn um, Kogon grass in order to control it? No. No, it will just come right back. Um, it has such an extensive rhizome um, under, underground, uh, the rhizome system that, and the root system, it will just come right back. 
that is often how they find that there's kogong grass in a pine plantation. They'll burn and uh, they'll find some dead trees. And when they come back a week later, there's this uh, light green grass popping back up. And that's the kogong grass. It's coming back before anything else is. Then the Georgia Forestry Commission, um, again, if you're in the state of Georgia, they are tackling that. So if you have a suspected infestation of kogon grass, um, contact them because they will treat it for free. You don't hear for free very often anymore. That is for sure. Another question that came earlier is for EdMaps. And um, I was wondering if you have a presentation handy to show them hands on some of the shots um, on the screen, how to, um, you know, post information and feed that data into the app. Um, people would like to know about that. Okay. Um, if you don't have one handy, I can share my screen because I was able to pull one of those. Okay. That would be good. Let me see here. All right, Richie, you may have to help me here. I'm, I know I have one, but it would just be hunting it. Let's see here. I can go online and show you EdMaps itself. All right, let's see how many of my screens you're going to see, because I have three here. <laughs> and uh, I pulled several interesting stories, in fact, but let me try to find the this one here. Let me know if you're seeing the smartphone app screen. Yes. OK. Yeah. Just tell me when to click. Okay. Um, so this is what the smartphone app looks like. And again, Seedon, we try to do everything, something you can say. So Southeast Early Detection Network is what that stands for. EdMaps is Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. So, you know, we just, if you can say it, it's easier to remember. Um, Using this, one of the best things, one of the things we tried to do was to make it very intuitive and very easy to use while still capturing the information you need for management. Okay, I want to click to the next. Um, so one of the things that I think is really awesome that you can do in the app is that you can, rather than just reporting a point, you can actually report a polygon. I mean, usually you're not reporting just one tree. You're usually reporting, say, a field of something or um, something along the riparian area. Or So it's, it's a bigger spot than just one tree covers. And so you can choose to either, uh, you can click on polygon if you want to do that. And then you can choose either vertices, which are just points to make the angles here. And you can make as many points as you want to. So, you know, you could do 10 points and cover this area exactly, and it'll fill that in for you. Plus, then it will automatically populate, like, how many square feet or square, or, or how many acres or square feet that covers. And then you can do um, free, free form, and that is just your phone is a touch screen, so you just draw it with your finger and um, click when you're done. And then again, that will automatically, you can see where it's put in how many acres it is there. It automatically populates that for you and on the other reporting screen. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so you can choose here. This is what I was talking about on the EdMaps Pro, where it speeds things up. Um, the previous screen is exactly the same in the EdMaps Pro. And um, once you draw your or make your point there, it will put you back to your list just like this, the list you've chosen beforehand. Um, but if you're in the Seedon app, it's going to first show you this. So you're going to have to choose, okay, I want to do species by category or all species, but say you know for sure what category it's in. So it's gonna pop up all the different categories for you. Because by the way, you can report all taxa. It's more than just plants. You can report pathogens um, and animals and they'll list them out in different ways too. So say it's um, here aquatics you're choosing 
and then it's going to give you a list of aquatics and you can scroll down through that and it's going to either um, alphabetize it by although it doesn't look alphabetized either way here it usually is supposed to alphabetize it either by common or scientific name and at the top is a place you can toggle to make it do whichever one you prefer some people are more comfortable with common names and some are more comfortable with scientific names and um, so it lets you search either way um, this is what the actual reporting form looks like so here you've got your little mapping button that's what you would click on to go if you want to draw a polygon. If you don't need to draw a polygon, it's automatically just going to register it as a point. And you can see here it's, it's pulled in your um, latitude and longitude, and it's telling you your accuracy. And of course, like any other GPS unit, the longer you stand there, the more accurate it will be. It gives you an option to choose how long you're, you've taken to do that. With Master Gardeners in particular, they have to record the time they spend, but with any business, they usually want to know how much time is being spent on something, so that can tell you that. Um, acres or square feet, your infestation, remember if you click on your map and do your polygon, it's going to fill that in automatically. Your density, is it low, medium, or high? You know, that's just, is there a lot of it or just a little of it? And your notes, um, you can put whatever notes you need to put in here. It might be um, anything to help you find this spot later. If you've ever tried to find the spot again with only the GPS coordinates, you know how difficult that can be. Um, so some notes to help direct, direct you to the exact spot again would be helpful. And one hint, if you're doing text um, or speech to text, keep your sentences short. So for example, on mine, I can say, found along the riparian corridor and it will do that perfectly but if i try to do a whole paragraph at one time it starts talking about cats and all kinds of weird things karen i'm gonna have to stop you right here uh, we have one last question to address before we take five minute break and it was sure. again about the kogon grass uh, what is the best chemical to control and what is the best time of year to spray um Again, um, what, so is the person asking not in the state of Georgia? They are That's in the state of Georgia, I believe. They are? Yes. Okay. Um, well, again, I would contact your Georgia Forestry Commission and because there's no, if you actually find coke on grass, there's no need for you to pay. The chemicals are expensive and as well as the time involved. And so there's not a need for you to do that when they will do it, do the work and provide the chemical for free. But if you have a spot that's on your property and you want to treat it, if you will contact them, they are the go-to for treating Kogon grass in Georgia. And they, they will give you those, that information. Let me see if I can get back to that slide that has their information on it to contact, um, oh, you'd have to put it back on my screen. But the Georgia, For oops, there it was. So the Georgia Forestry Commission, um, depending on where you are in Georgia, it will be Lynn Womack, that's 912-515-5180, that's for North Georgia. For um, kind of East Middle Georgia is Chris Barnes, and the coast, most of the coastline, 912-601-7093. And for the Southwest, uh, all of South, the most Southern state uh, counties in Georgia is Mark McClure, 229-869-8592. And I'm, I know they will be glad to talk with you about it. I've worked with all three of them. Thank you, Karen. This was excellent. If you have more questions for Karen, uh, she showed her contact information or send your questions to us and we will forward them to her. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. And it is time to take five minutes before our next speaker. Thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Thanks.